he is, would you please stand for his word? Because Jesus of Nazareth is King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, we thank you as we speak. I love this in Ephesians. I love it in Thessalonians. I love it in Colossians. But this one just covers so much more territory. So, Father, I, I ask you and I already thank you for each one of us, for your wisdom, for your revelation, for the knowledge of you, for the eyes of our understanding be opened and enlightened so that we can know what is the hope of your calling, what is the riches of your glory, what is our inheritance as your children, and what is the exceeding greatness. Oh, what is your exceeding greatness for us? For you have given us your inheritance, and now we take it by faith, and as the word of God is going out not only through myself, but through Pastor Kenny. We believe that each word that's spoken becomes a substance, and that substance will go to whoever will receive that word. And I thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Do you agree? Yes. We've got agreement. So whenever you have agreement, you're in good shape. Well, um, some of you have already read this this morning. Faith to faith. All right, we want to get this. I I really really like this book, and every year I go through it. You all know that, but I want you to understand why would you give tithes and offerings? Because first of all, he commands you to do it, but he still gives you a choice. He gives you a choice to give the tithes, and then he gives you a choice to give the offering. But we forget about the offering, right? Oh, I give myself. No, 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 no. Stop and look at what the word says, right? Because when you go into a battle, you always want to remember, I gave of myself because I love you and I trust you and I know I've got victory in this whole situation. Everything I go into, I have victory before I even get there because I look back to tithing and offering. Why? Because I am showing him that I trust him. I'm not giving to get. I am giving because I love him and I trust him that he is going to lead and guide me in every area of my life. So what does it say here? It's on November 14th. When the pressure is on, what do you do? Quit. You don't? What do you do? You keep on going. All right. How old are you today? Tomorrow? Tuesday? Fifty-seven? Would that be true? Okay. Fifty-seven years ago, you know, all of a sudden you think, this has got to come out of there. This ain't going to be pretty. <laughs> but there's no going back. There's no going back. Okay? There was no going back. No going back. No going back. What could you have? Knock me out. Do it again. Give me some liquor. I, wanna, I, I don't want to go through this. I heard women screaming like that in the hospital. So what do you do? You make up your mind beforehand, I'm going into battle, and I always win. I never lose. So what does he say? When the pressure is on, then they that feared the Lord, that means awe and believed the Lord, spoke, at, spoke often one to the other, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written, oh, I wonder what that is beside the word of God, before him, for them that feared, that awed the Lord and trust the Lord. Did you get that? You awe him. Fear means there to awe him and trust him that no matter what battle you're going into, you win. We all, I always win. Because God never wastes a battle. For those who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, it says, have you ever noticed that those who have most exciting faith experience testimonies are those who have been under pressure at some time in their lives? Did you ever? I don't want to go through it. But people will purposely, not you guys, oh, I'm so proud of you. 
You're like, no, I don't want to do anything because you know what? If I do, I'm going to get a lot of pressure from the devil. You're going to get more pressure because he's going to beat you up all the more because you just turned to him and made him your daddy. No, no, no. I always win. So, he says, they're the people who stayed faithful when the pressure was on. People who believed God's promises and prosperity in the midst of the desperate financial situations or people who trusted God for healing in the face of what? Terminal disease. My friend, now this is by Gloria, my friend, when you get into a hard spot, that's not the time to back out on God and begin to say, well, God, why did you let this happen to me? Why do we do that? Why do we try to blame God when it's our responsibility? He's given us all the authority, and he has given us a covenant. We have a covenant, and through that covenant, I give of myself. I get to give. I don't have to give. I get. But I know we have a covenant, and I'm doing my part. But I love you, and I know that every battle I go into, I've already won the battle. I've already won the battle. It's guaranteed. I bring it up over and over with our son-in-law. 5% chance to live. Tracy corrected me. 20 minutes dead. And the things that, if I would have taken pictures of all this stuff we saw in the hospital, you'd go, oh, oh, oh. We saw it, but we didn't receive it. Because we know we have a covenant with God, and with those covenant rights, because we love him, we are giving ourselves. So whenever we have need, we're going to take it by faith. We're going to take what God has prepared for us. Now, when we're doing that, let's, let's, get, our, let's get our communion cups out here, please. Let's pass that out. I have to get this open. Where is Dee Dee? I know you're watching online, Dee Dee, for you and Tom. You just got, she's got them two little butter balls. Little babies. Oh, come on. Thanks, Steve. Somebody always bails me out. Did you get that? So God puts people there to bail me out. Why are we standing this morning? Because we're standing in the presence of God. When Esther came up to present herself, she stood in the presence of the king. We stand in the presence of the king. Right? By the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. And when that shofar horn blew, whenever you come here on Sundays and you, you come sick, you come, you have money problems. I don't care what it is. That shofar horn, blow, shofar horn blows. You're telling the devil, I'm coming and I'm taking back my stuff. Amen. How's things going on in your family? How's things going on at the workplace? I'm taking back my stuff. I'm taking back my stuff. Got it? That's enough of you taking from me. I am taking back my stuff. So, Father, I thank you that I have a covenant. Each one of you have a covenant with him, and that covenant says you belong to him and you are in him. So when he says in him, you are in his protection. You are in him. Get that in your mind. You are in him. You're in his room. You're in his territory. You can't get out. The doors are locked. You are safe. That's why we take communion. His body was broken for us. And now we take his healing. We take his prosperity. We take everything. All the rec recompense. In Jesus' name, let's eat. And the blood. And the blood. Animal's blood was on the doorpost of God's chosen in Egypt. 
the blood covered those people. Now the blood personally covers us. Nothing by any means shall hurt you. I am so excited. You know what? I get so excited about coming for prayer back there and just praising and worshiping. So when I come here, I feel like I'm just wired, just wired because of the blood. The blood never loses its power, and when you plead the blood of Jesus over yourself or over any situation, any situation, and you agree with me right now, Wednesday night situation, when we have the meeting, and we'll explain a little bit to that later, at the meeting, we're coming and we're getting our schools back. We're getting our kids back because we are junkyard dogs. We don't quit until we win, right? Because we have a covenant and we have the blood and anything under the blood wins. Let's drink. So let's do this. What song you got for us, Debbie? Good God. Oh, get yourself ready. You got your dancing shoes on, guys? Oh, let's just do it. Oh, I just can't wait. You just sang over your tithes and offerings. That's pretty good. What, what does that have? When you sing, what does that happen? What happens? What happens when you sing? You are saying, God, I trust you, and I know I got it, and I'm coming to get my stuff. Oh, God, you've already got it and supplied it for me. Okay, I'll take it. Isn't that exciting? Thank you, Father. Father, I bless each one here. I plead the blood of Jesus over the hands that work to, to bring that in to your kingdom. Because, Father, it's given unto you. Not unto the church, but unto you. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Do you agree? Well, Pastor Kenny, come on up, and uh, what we're going to do, like I said at the end of a little bit, but he's going to do some teaching here. Whoops, you're coming that way. Come on up. And uh, uh, because, why don't you be seated? You know, people, if you don't know how to do something, how can you be held accountable? You cannot be held accountable if you don't know, but we want to find out, don't we? So now we're going to find out how men should be men. Not just males, but there's going to come a time we're going to learn about the women, too. So we each have our parts to play, don't we? Okay? And after a while, when Pastor Kenny is done, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk just a little bit about what we're going to be doing on Wednesday night. So don't leave. Stick around. Okay? All Thank right. you, Mr. Fredrickson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. You're a little surprised when you woke up this morning and see the white? <laughs> so, God's just cleansing the earth. So, anyway, um, we've been listening to a series of Creflo Dollars tapes, and we're going to continue listening to them, and we may repeat some of them. Why would we repeat some of them? Because um, you need to hear it again, and when you view it the first time or listen to it the first time, you probably miss quite a bit of it. So that's why we're going to kind of go through and review. And so the first tape that we listened to was uh, Creflo was teaching on biblical leadership. That was the first tape that we were listened to. Uh, Creflo showed us how men have not been taught properly in the church. If you have ever attended other churches, you've probably heard that. You've probably heard how wrong the teachings were. But So Creflo is trying to get the proper way to us. Amen. So, Amen. <clears throat> you know, we, are, we have, uh, are born a male, but we need to learn how to become a man. That's one of the things he was emphasizing in that first tape. We need to learn that a husband, um, the the a husband needs to have fed to him biblical understandings of what his role is in a, in a marriage. And not only just uh, husbands in a marriage, but also single men, too, need to know what their role is. 
So that's where Creflo is really getting on that and trying to get that across to us. God released his word to Jesus, Jesus, who was a male, right? Jesus was a male. So uh, God released his word to uh, Jesus, and then Jesus released, released the word to man, who is a male. So um, when, when that word is released from Jesus, the man to man, that's where our part is supposed to pick up. That's where we need to go from there. Jesus is the faucet that feeds man, and man's supposed to open that faucet so he can feed the woman, the wife, or the children. And usually when the man feeds the husband, he uh, feeds the wife, she'll take and uh, feed the children and feed the family. So that's our... Um, Somebody didn't like what I was saying? <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, we're, that faucet, the man's supposed to be the faucet to feed the family. And so last week, um, last week, uh, tape, uh, basically, um, uh, Kreflos was talking about uh, two different kinds of relationships. He says there's two uh, kinds of relationships in, in a marriage. Um, he talked about uh, God and man, the relationship that is, that's there, that's the most important relationship in a marriage is between God and man. So we got to make sure that we as males, to become a man, we need to pay attention to those relationships and, and uh, really hone in on them. A man needs that, man needs that relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship with God, he's not going to have a very good relationship in his marriage. So <clears throat> man needs that. The second relationship he talked about was the marriage relationship. And he says, we cannot have a good marriage relationship without the Word of God. Do you believe that? Yes. We, yeah. we need the Word of God. So you, you may want to take a look. What relationships do you have? And where do you get your relationship? Or where are you honing into? And what are you standing on? Are you standing on the word of God? Or are you standing on what somebody else has been feeding into your life? So you need to go back to the word. Um, <clears throat> and marriage is, is, is with two. So we need to be, we need to know that there's a third one. You know, marriage is two people, but there's a third one also. And that's Jesus. Every marriage needs Jesus. So the, we need to make sure we're including Jesus in on that relationship. And, you know, we need to remember marriage is a gift from God. It's not just a piece of paper that you get when you get married. Whether it be in a church or at Justice of the Peace, you get a piece of paper. It, that's not what the, the real gift is, the gift of God that you're getting when you get married. <clears throat> uh, Creflo talked about control in a marriage. That's where um, a lot of marriages go wrong because they do not get to control things down pat because they had some wrong teaching or they don't rightly divide the word on that control. We need to divide the word on headship and control and then be submitting to one another. That's what we need to do. So we look at how the world looks at marriages, and it, but we need to look at how God looks at marriages and, and where we stand on that. Um, God looks at it in, he, God looks at it this way in Ephesians. In Ephesians uh, 5, he says, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. Notice he didn't say, Submit to one, he says, submit to one another. That means husbands and wives submitting to each other. Why should submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So, if we get the proper teaching on that, 
this is where a lot of people read that. And uh, there's one single man in this church that kind of, <laughs> he kind of quotes that scripture, but he's quoting it wrong always. <laughs> so so any, anyway, we need to rightly divide those scriptures so that we understand them and know where we're going with that. Man needs to know the word to live in a good marriage. And um, 1 Corinthians 11.3 11, 3, 11, 3 tells us that, what we need to know. It says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So we need to get those in order to make sure we understand that. So we are to get our nourishment from the Word so we can be that faucet that we can be as a man. We get that nourishment from the Lord so that we can feed it into our wives and into our children. You know, if you get it, if you're having it fed to your wife, it's going to get to the children. Because why is that? Because the woman is usually the one that's working with the kids. Now, now I know some of you guys work with your kids a lot, and that's good, but you've got to make sure you what's coming out of that faucet, that you're getting the right nourishment. <clears throat> so now what, what, you, what usually happens with, in church settings and church, church teachings, what usually happens? There is an enemy out there, right? And that enemy is Satan. And Satan wants to keep the man from the word. Why does Satan want to keep the man from the word? Why? Because he knows, Satan knows if he can keep the man from the word, he has weakened that male. He has weakened that male structure in a marriage. So he wants to keep the, the, uh, the word from man. And so a lot of men bow to that. They bow down to that, and they let Satan have his way. They become a weak man in a marriage because Satan is rules them. We need to remember how to take our headship as a man and take that into your family. <clears throat> the reason why Satan is able to do that a lot of times is because the guy will say, oh, I'll just let my wife do it. Or if a question is asked, oh, I'll ask my wife. She'll answer that. That's what happens in a lot of marriages. And we, we got to turn that around like Creflo is trying to teach us in, the, in these DVDs. So, um, Creflo tells us in that DVD that we watched last week, what was one of, the, one of the things he said that probably touched a lot of male? He said, he said one thing that touched, I know it touches a lot of male. He says, Women are a work of art. Now, some of you guys think your wives are really a work of art in a different way, but Creflo is talk, talking about a work of art as spiritual as they are and what a leader they are. So he says they are a work of art, art and we got to remember that they're very intelligent. Women are very intelligent, and a lot of guys don't want to give their wives or a woman credit for that. They are very intelligent. So as men, we need to re show, receive that and appreciate that of a woman. So with that, we're going to go to the third uh, DVD, and I'll have the soundboard bring it up, and we're going to view that DVD. And then instead of talking a lot about that DVD, I got a sheet that I want to ask you Men and women, I want to ask you these questions when we're done with this DVD. All right, sound tarp team, let's go. Relationship without intimacy, listen to me now, is a false relationship and it is false intimacy that didn't travel through the bridge of vulnerability it, 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 it is false intimacy. Satan wants to stop intimacy between a man and his wife. Intimacy, that, that, that ability to, 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 be, to see things that nobody else can see. And, and, and you, have to, you have to go through a couple of stages to get to intimacy. First of all, that woman 
has to feel safe, and then she wants to be safe enough to be vulnerable, and then the intimacy will be genuine. But also, a man, he doesn't feel safe because a man law. He's afraid to be vulnerable, vulnerable because he might feel like he might be discovered or hurt. So what he does is he hides under a cover. And what you do is you, see, you, 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 you give off a false identity. We don't see the real you. We see the you coming from the covers that you are under. Because you're afraid to be discovered that you might not be the man that you portrayed. And you don't feel safe because the pressure is put on you to be this thing that the man law tells you to be, and you don't know what your responsibilities are as a man, so you cover up, pretend like you're the real thing, but we're getting the fake identity, which means if you are fake in who you are, you're going to be fake in the intimacy, and you're afraid that I can't get out from under this cover, don't, don't they going to see me as I really am. So relationships without intimacy is a, it's, it's a false relationship. It's a false relationship. You may, you may be married to a man that has portrayed that false identity for years because he doesn't feel safe with you, because he didn't know what his job was, because he didn't understand the power of his words. And now he's spoken wrong words and tried to carry out the religious definition of headship when all the time he's been in hiding, afraid that he'll be discovered. That's why you got them corona divorces. <laughs> I'm too close to you for too long, and you're about to discover that I'm not the man you thought I was. See, every man's deepest fear is to be found out, to be discovered as an imposter and not really a man. And the question you find yourself asking, am I really a man? Have I got what it takes when it counts? And to add on that, let the woman who's been so frustrated with the lack of nourishment finally look at you one day and say, you ain't no man. Why is it so hurtful? Why is it so offensive? Because the whole time you've been wondering the same thing. Am I really a man? Do I have what it takes? when it counts. You see how messed up this is? And because we didn't break it down, because we didn't rightly divide the word, and because we didn't allow grace of God to come in, and we didn't understand biblical equality, then we operated by the lie that the church put out about your headship, and you were so busy trying to get control, and when you couldn't get control, you were ready to divorce and leave because she a Jezebel. I know more men with the Jezebel spirit than I know women with the Jezebel spirit. <laughs> Jezebel spirit is just rebellion to what's supposed to happen. And we are now raising up a generation of men by men who don't understand manhood. And it's scary and it's frustrating and it's all those things because we've never understood, I would call it the right perspective of manhood. The dog passed the first day back. Why are you messing with us? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's about getting things in order. Getting things in order. Somebody says, well, I don't, I don't see the big deal. I'm, I'm about to tell you. You see, the less a guy feels like a real man in the presence of a woman, the more vulnerable he becomes to pornography. Listen to me. The less a guy feels like a real man in the presence of his woman, the more vulnerable he is to pornography. Why? 
because he's not getting real intimacy, so he thinks it's cool to replace it with fake intimacy. Intimacy that doesn't make me accountable for anything. Intimacy that doesn't put pressure on me. Intimacy that doesn't judge me and make me feel like what I know I am. Y'all ain't ready for this. Go back home, get back on the screen so you can turn me off when you get tired of it. Those of you who are on stream, don't turn that thing off, man. Pornography is merely an attempt to create the illusion of intimacy while falling terribly short of that goal. It's actually born out of a fear of real intimacy with others. I'm not just talking about sexual intimacy. The fear of real intimacy with other people moves you to look for a fake intimacy that you think can replace your fear of real intimacy. That you're stuck playing the game all day. And you say, I, I just love playing the game. No, you don't. You don't have real intimacy with nobody else. See, it goes in different levels. You know, you, you, you'll replace your relationship with intimacy with God, which your intimacy with yourself becomes so self-consumed. You will replace your intimacy with a friend uh, with uh, intimacy with uh, your addictions, with even social media and all, that, all those kind of things. You'll try to, that's what they call it when you get somebody to get on your social media. It call, they, they call it your friends. We think we can replace that real intimacy with something that's fake. And then when you get, in, when you get married and, and that real intimacy is not taking place there, and, and I'm talking about before you get into bed. See, real intimacy will guarantee you you'll get, you'll, you'll, let, me, let me rephrase that. Real, <laughs> don't, be, don't be nasty, Cora. <laughs> uh, you, you know what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> so, so all of this is born out of the fear of real intimacy with others, and ultimately it leads to emotional isolation and despair. I don't know how to have intimate relationship with nobody. I don't have an intimate relationship with God. I don't have an intimate relationship with friends. There are, I, I need somebody I can talk to. I don't even know how to engage that. I don't even know how to cultivate a trusting relationship with somebody that's not toxic. Because I'm holding on to whatever happened to me when I thought I had a relationship and it shut me down. And now I'm fearful or afraid that might happen again. See, we don't, we don't understand what's on the line. God created us for relationship and we're still trying to ignore the fact that we are relational beings. And you think that you, you, should, sit, you should get some award by being by yourself and I don't need nobody. See, now you're lying to yourself. I don't need nobody. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. And you know, I, 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 I'm gonna do it my way and I'm gonna be by myself. You're gonna be crazy when somebody finally meets you because you, you need somebody to help you to grow. You need somebody to tell you that looks ridiculous. You need somebody to say you're mean. You need somebody to say, you know, you're, you're talking too much. You need somebody to say you got that wig on, you need a chin strap. You need somebody to help you. You need somebody to tell you those things. <laughs> Relationship is designed to be a blessing, not a curse. That even sometimes you encounter those situations that hurt and their betrayal and, and, and all those kind of things, you don't give up on relationship. You just need to let the Holy Spirit kind of help you to know who to hook up with, and then you need to learn how to pay attention to the signs and the signals that you see about a person in the beginning. See, what we do is we see the sign and the signal and we ignore it. He's just too fine for me to let go. And he's giving you a signal that something matter with him, something wrong, and you won't pay attention to it. And now you're going to ask the question, how come I keep draw, drawing the same kind of man? Because you keep ignoring the signals. Well, how does a person become, how does a person become 
hooked on porn? And what role does fear play in that process? So I think, like, why are you talking about pornography in church? <laughs> yeah. A person's carnal desires, carnal or of the five senses, the things that move you in your senses. A person's carnal desires, which are based in selfishness, that's what it is, are what the enemy uses to draw them into addictive behaviors. It's the stuff that makes you feel good, the stuff that looks good, the stuff that sounds good. And, and you find yourself self-centered, and you find yourself in selfishness, then the enemy will use these things to draw you into addictive behavior. And it's almost like the first time you got a hit, hit off cocaine, you, you, you struggle the rest of your life to try to get that same thing to re be reproduced. So you have to deal with these carnal desires. You're, you yield to it because this makes me feel good. And then if you come to church, you tell people, well, God still loves me. <laughs> well, hold on. That's an excuse because he loved you before you even got saved. So what does that mean? Y'all don't hear what I just said. You know, well, God still loves me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, you know what? He's always loved you. So does it make you feel better to remind yourself that God still loves you as an excuse for your addictive behaviors? It's easy to say, well, you know, you know, God loves me even though I'm doing this. But you can also say God loves me enough to deliver me from doing this. You can say that too. I think we've become a nation filled with excuses. And then we come to church and we demand the preacher adjust his sermons to fit the excuses because they make you feel good. I heard you, you just told me to shut up. Mm -mm. Anytime we violate the commandment of love, fear is automatically present. Anytime we violate the commandment of love, fear will automatically be present. And when we seek to take care of our needs outside of God, we are far from walking in love when we seek to take care of our needs outside of God. That describes the whole world right now. I am not interested in God. I want to take care of my needs. I don't need God. And we're living in an entire generation who will basically have turned their back on God, have chosen their selfish ways, and have gathered enough people to say, my behavior, if it's all right with these people, then it's all right, even though it's not all right with God. And so what happens is when we're not walking in love, since love is what casts out all fear, then we can't be selfish and expect to be free from fear's torment. It, you, you, a lot of this comes because I'm selfish. It's kind of like when a baby's born, a baby's selfish. You know, the same thing is true with the marriage. When a marriage is born, there's a lot of selfishness involved in that marriage. And it's very uncomfortable for you to begin to recognize, I didn't know I was this selfish. But that marriage is going to begin to challenge you to grow and to think that while women have been coming to church and supporting the church all of these centuries, it was the man that should have been at the door first. And it is still the man that should be at the door first. And I am determined at World Changes Church International that we are going to see the number of men outnumber women that come in because if we don't, if we're the faucet, 
if, if, it, if it flows with us, if the nourishment comes from our faucet, if anybody needs to have a relationship with God and understand God and walk with intimacy with God, we should. We should be going around in the definition of manhood. Men don't cry and men walk around tough. No, we should be the guys on our face, crying out before God, lifting our hands up in praise service. We should be closer to God than anybody so that everybody in our family is nourished by us. But how can that happen when we, when we think that that's the woman's job? You go. That's the woman's job. You pray. That's the woman's job. You develop a relationship with God and tell me about it. We've been tricked. Our real authority is in our intimate relationship with God. We have been fooled. And like all men in here, oh, if I would have known this when I first understood who I was. If I'd have been, if I'd have known that I was the faucet, I thought I was supposed to be the boss and felt insecure because I didn't have boss-like qualities. Because the, the woman, the woman actually carries a lot more creative authority than a man. A man actually submits a lot better than a woman does. Somebody say, how you get that? Baby, what you want to eat? Whatever you want to do, baby. <laughs> Well, where you want to go? Just let me know. <laughs> you ask a woman, say, what you want to eat? Well, uh, I'm not sure. No, I don't want that. No, I had that yesterday. <laughs> you want to, want to go here? No, we already went there. Let's go somewhere new. But see, that's why God gave you that responsibility, and that's why God gave that woman. It's easy for a woman to submit to the person that's responsible for her healthy nourishment. But, but men don't want to do it. They don't want to learn how to be a man. They think a man is only defined by what hangs between their legs. You're not a man, you're a male man, you're, you're, or a milkman, you know, back in the day, or, or, or a postman, you know. <laughs> but, but you're not a real man. You're not a real man. And so what's, what's messed up our society is now intimacy is coming from places where it don't need to come. Well, you know, all churches are the same. You better get this right. No, they're not. 28,000 churches closed during the pandemic, and that is not bad news. Some of them have no business in the pulpit. This is where we are now. People came to church trying to get an understanding of something and got some crazy doctrine that says you should be dominating your wife. I remember, I remember coming up where I was told, you know, as a pastor, you got to make sure you control your wife. And if you don't control your wife, you can't be an elder in the church. I said, I heard that. So I'm going up thinking, well, you know, when I get married, I'm going to have to control my wife. Man, I tried that stuff on Taffy. It didn't work good at all. <laughs> it just didn't work right. It was just when... I like control. <laughs> uh-uh. And it took all these years, and then this, this, this is like a perfect Adam and Eve scenario in my life and in my marriage. God had to, God had to put Eve there because Adam could never get to the place where he's supposed to be. He all over the garden. <laughs> and she's trying to say, listen, we can eat of all the fruit of the garden. Why are you just hanging? Why are you here? You hanging around what's forbidden. You got your focus on what's forbidden. Here, come on, let's go on out here. Come on, come on, let's go on here. Mm -mm, I'm staying right here. 
God, dog, it's the same way. God had to take my wife out of the country to another country and teach her on biblical uh, equality. Call, she called me from that country. She said, I ain't the same. I said, don't be bringing no mess here now. <laughs> you ain't going to be none if you don't make nothing. Don't bring it. I was scared. I ain't know what she was going to come back here and do. <laughs> I'm like, I ain't the one. <laughs> you mess up, but we get a divorce, and I'm going to get me a non-biblically quality wife <laughs> who just say, yes, master. See how cracked up that is? And she got back and fortunately I understood the gospel of grace enough to hear what she was saying and broke it down. Why is it that God has to continuously use women to bring a man where he needs to be? It's a strange thing to my hearing when I hear a man say, that woman made me a better man. It's cool, but it's like somehow another man was supposed to impart that. The woman's supposed to be the recipient of manhood, not the developer of manhood. But it got so bad, it got so bad, it took a woman who we said there was no equality with, to do things. In fact, you, you look at the Bible, you think it's all men pastors the church. The guy who pastored that church and the guy who was the bishop of that guy pastored that church was submitted to a woman who was the apostle over the bishop and the pastor because all the churches were in houses. Have I told you that? And I'm going to get to it in a minute, I hope, and we talk about the, the woman is the weaker vessel. Are you kidding me? <laughs> The men have got to come up. And it's not happening until you stop ignoring that first primary relationship. Do you have a relationship with God and a relationship with the Word? You should know the Word. Submission. All right. How would you like that? <laughs> <laughs> I even got poked a couple times. No. <laughs> I, hard to believe, but <laughs> but anyway, um, th there's so much in this thing at one time. You need to hear it over and over. And um, um, I actually jumped ahead one, so we need we need to um, cover the one that I jumped ahead of because it all leads up to this. And this, this list of uh, questions that I got um, for everybody, this isn't just for the men in here, it's for the women also. And it's also, this is also, uh, I'm gonna add, you know, let the ushers know or let somebody know that you would like a copy of these questions that you know, we won't have it for you today, but we'd have it for you next week that you can take it. And the, um, the women that are here whose husbands do not attend, attend the church, I suggest you take this and give it to your husbands and let them read it and see how they respond to it. So, okay. Now, this is not just for you guys. This is for me also, what, what I'm going to read here. Because a lot of stuff in here that I'm going to say, it's a question, but what I'm saying is, a lot of these things I did not do uh, and am not doing. So I need to adjust too. I need to get in line also. So here we go. Got a whole list here. Now, this is, this is a list of questions what men should know so they know what to do. Okay, question, what should men do to nourish his wife? Does a man's nourishing his wife improve her health? What should a man do for his wife? What is the real meaning of manhood? What does my wife need? You know, a lot of this here, we're hearing. We're, we're hearing the answers to it. 
but are we taking it serious? Are we going to try to change and do what he's telling us? Um, what does my wife need? What does my wife want? Is the only time I pay attention to my wife is when I want sex? What makes my wife feel secure? What makes my wife happy? Do you feel that your wife is overworked? Do you speak the word of God into your wife? Do you tell, do I tell my wife that I appreciate her? And how often do I do that? Does a man spend too much time on the phone when his wife is around? Not just on the phone, it's on Facebook and all this other junk. Um, do I spend more time on, on my phone or watching sports or reading the newspaper than I do with my wife? Do you know the word so you can speak the word into your wife? Does the, you know, no, I, I ask a lot of questions. Now here's some for the women. Does the woman spend too much time on the cell phone, reading magazines and books and social media and all this other stuff, and when she should be spending time with her husband? Does she have time when her husband comes, you know, because he doesn't do it very often, all of a sudden he comes and he wants to know about something and she don't have time for him. It's just like what the guy does to the wife. So does a man put his wife down in front of people, especially trying to correct or prove them wrong? Or does she do that to, to, does she do that to her husband as well? Put him down in front of other people. Um, had a sister-in-law that did that all the time. She put her husband down in front of people all the time. She made, she made sure she made a point of it to do it. So, okay. <clears throat> Does the husband or wife put each other down in front of other people? Or they argue about something in front of other people? That's a no-no. You never should do that. So I got this list of questions. Like I said, uh, am I going to force you to take these? No, I'm going to leave that up to you. Ask if you want a set of this, just let somebody know. Ashers know, Donna know, or somebody know, and we'll make copies of them and have them for you next week. So that's, that's what uh, I have for today. And again, just take to heart some of that message today. And we'll go over that again because there was so much in that DVD. So uh, that's all I got for today. Pastor Jan, you want to? Yes. Is it possible to play something on here so people so it'll be louder so people can hear it? I don't know. it but it, I can only get it on my phone. I can't transfer it to anybody else's phone. I want to do it back there. Can we do it back there? Now I'm wondering if we should end the service. Yes. We're going to end the service, and we're going to bless the people in the name of Jesus. Turn that off, and you're going to turn this on, and okay.